It used to be said, and perhaps it's still said, that um, if the Communist Party of Great Britain had had the geographical network and the resources that the Christian Church, and particularly the Church of England, has in these islands, we would have been a Stalinist dictatorship many years ago. <laughs> Communism, as we understand it, has gone so unbelievably wrong, almost as much as Christianity. <laughs> because their real ambition has nothing whatever to do with the environment. I first learnt this when uh, the late Eric Ellington, who was one of the founders of Greenpeace, who became quite a friend of mine and was a genuine environmentalist, nobody more non-political than he, told me that a couple of years after they had founded Greenpeace, they had all had to leave because they weren't politicians and they weren't political. They didn't know how to deal with the Marxists who, he said, had taken over the organisation for purposes that clearly had nothing to do with the environment and were everything to do with destroying the economies of the West as fast as possible from within without a shot being fired. And I said to him, Eric, I said, look, you're about as political as a rabbit. And you're talking about Marxists having taken over your movement. Doesn't this all sound a bit kind of flaky and extreme? He said, look, that's what happened. The Berlin Wall came down, all these people piled out of it, piled into the Green Movement, and they've taken it over and they're running it. He said, I call them watermelons. They're green on the outside and red on the in. My own phrase for these people who are at this Rio conference is the traffic light tendency. The green's too yellow to admit they're really reds. And this conference, from their point of view, has been a resounding failure. And from my point of view, as somebody who loves the West and would like to see it survive without being destroyed from within, it was a triumphant success. They had hoped to get the nations of the world to make binding commitments effectively to allow the United Nations to become a sort of world government. Now, you may think, listening to this, that that's rather extreme, talking about global government. Well, Al Gore's been talking about it, Jacques Chirac of France has been talking about it, Jacques Attali of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development has been talking about it. An awful lot of politicians have been talking about the desirability of, as they see it, global government. We know from the September the 15th, 2009 draft of what had been intended to be the Copenhagen Treaty, which fortunately failed when it was exposed to the public gaze, that they were indeed intending to put forward a 186-page blueprint for a global government with all its structures, all its revenue sources, the direct power of taxation given to the UN over the members of the UN, direct powers of environmental intervention, and the word government actually appears in this context twice in the draft of the treaty. You'll find it at Annex 1, sections 36 and 38. And they wanted to do the same here. They realised they could no longer bring forward the climate as an excuse, and you barely heard climate change mentioned here. Oh, it's still in the text. It's still there, but it's no longer the number one issue. That's where I'd want to go back to um, the Hebrew Scriptures and the concept of Jubilee that you mentioned. And uh, it's been sort of dusted off and deepened in discussion in the last couple of decades in the ways we've heard. And essentially, it's a system of amnesty in cycles of seven years and cycles of seven times seven, 49 years, there is essentially a debt amnesty. And this is laid out in some detail in some of the books in Hebrew scripture, particularly in Leviticus. Um, and since you may not all instantly have this at your fingertips, um, <laughs> let me just pick out a couple of details from the discussion there, because I think there are at least four principles in the account of this in Leviticus, four principles which are of real substantive value in thinking these issues through today. Second principle is a very radical one indeed. The land, which is the source of economic wealth and security in that pre-modern society, the land doesn't belong to anybody. The land itself is on loan to you.
from God. It's not a possession. Therefore, you are all already indebted in some sense. And to treat the possession of land and property and disposable wealth as if it were absolute possession is to misunderstand the whole nature of your humanity in a world where you are dependent on what you haven't made. This is a world in which you are dependent on what you haven't made. You're always, in that sense, indebted to start with. And in Leviticus, God says very firmly, I own the land. <laughs> That's to say, you are all having the use of the land for a period. And when you're trading what you think is property, what you're actually trading is use. Practice. The practice of wealth production. It's, it's a habit. It's a human practice. It's not based on absolute ownership. So there are four rather interesting principles, I think, and I, I don't think they're just relevant to the Bronze Age in the Middle East. The very fundamental one, ownership is never absolute. We are all dependent in advance on what we didn't make and don't possess. There are several passages in scripture we might talk about here, but I'll pick up just one or two of them. That means that our attitude to the world around us, just like our attitude to other persons, must never be one of possession. We don't own. We are given, but we don't own. So, for example, if you look at what's said in Leviticus, in the famous chapter 25 about the Jubilee, you'll see that there's a prohibition on the absolute sale of land. You don't sell each other land forever because the land isn't yours. God says, as a matter of fact, the earth is mine. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, as we heard earlier. The earth is mine. What you're selling, says Leviticus, when you exchange contracts about land, you're selling a certain period of use. You're selling a series of harvests. You're selling part of the process of sustaining people and keeping the community alive. But you're not owning something which you transfer to somebody else's ownership. God has lent the land to us, the earth, so that we may feed each other. Not as something which we simply seize and squeeze dry. The awareness that we're to grow into, the global awareness, is crucially that awareness of living in a world we don't own and don't control. And if you like, the great opposition in the spiritual life is between an attitude of possessiveness, grasping, and delight and contemplation, on the other hand. The more we can get towards the delight and contemplation, the better. The more we're growing into God's delight in the world. The more we slip towards Grasping, squeezing, ownership, the further away we move from a faithful lifestyle and a lifestyle in which we are growing towards God. So those are a few of the basics I would want to play in to this discussion about climate change as a matter of faith. Our response to the crisis of climate change, to the needs of those most at risk in our world from a changing climate. Our response, if it's to be a response of faith, needs to be a response informed by all of that sense of letting go, of stepping back from ownership and control, learning to look at the environment with something of God's eyes. Because if the majority of scientists are right, Part of the problem that's part of the process that's brought us here is generations of possessiveness, grasping, and therefore unfaith, looking at ourselves and our world with eyes other than God's.
back to Leviticus. You know, God has given us the use of the land, not as a possession, but as something we use in order to nourish a community. And that's what we have to keep in focus, I think. So, faithfulness is indivisible, you could say. If we're going to be faithful to the human creation, we're called to be faithful to the creation overall. And it seems to me that that particular theme is one which can make sense in our congregations as we talk about it. Because it drives us back to those basic, profound stories and texts which make up the scriptural record. They point us back to the God who sees creation and says it is very good. The God who promises never again to destroy creation after the flood. The God who in the law of Moses lays down that the land shall not be anybody's property forever. Because this earth, this material stuff in which we grow things, on which we build things, is just lent to us. The land is God's, and that means that nobody has an absolute claim of possession over it. That has its own implications and a long story there too. But it means at least that we've got to learn to regard the very stuff on which we stand as something other than our property, something other than what we can just stuff into our pockets and take home for our private purposes. Good evening, Rowan. It's the 14th of February, 2016, and it's about half past ten. And I'm obviously making you this video to wish you a happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> it must be very complicated for you deciding who to spend Valentine's Day with. <laughs> with your somewhat checkered past. Anyway, of course, it's my Sunday evening video to reassure you I haven't been seducing any priests over the weekend. Despite it being Valentine's Day, I somehow managed to restrain myself just for a change. Anyway, I thought we could carry on having a little chat about your environmentalism. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to talk about the book of Leviticus, chapter 25 of Leviticus, in a minute. But first of all, I want to mention um, something that isn't on a video anywhere, so I can't include it in. Um, but it's the fact that you were on an MI5 watch list for being a subversive Trotskyite Bolshevik communist. Um, involved with this uh, very left-wing group of clergy um, and I've got an article about it here in the Daily Telegraph uh, which is also reported as being quite right-wing uh, compared to other British newspapers but you won't snipe at Telegraph readers will you because they probably got more power than Daily Mail readers so you wouldn't dare go upsetting them would you <laughs> you know which side your bread's buttered on don't you <laughs> So this is uh, one quotation from this article in the Telegraph. He wrote the original manifesto for the Jubilee group, claiming capitalism was in its death throes and threatens to inflict even greater violence on mankind than it has done before. Um, so there you were on this um, MI5 watch list for being subversively left-wing shall we say actually I'm just going to show you this photo again because I want to comment on it there you are in fancy dress holding a banner a socialist worker banner that doesn't really mean anything because socialist worker party hands out placards to people who 
turn up at demonstrations. So even if someone's holding a socialist worker banner, it doesn't mean they support the socialist worker party or that they're a member of it. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but I do happen to know uh, what it says on that placard that you're holding because um, the same picture was available on a postcard at the National Mining Museum of Wales where you're actually holding the placard up and it says Sack Major, not the Miners, which is quite ironic really. <laughs> Uh, Major being John Major, who was the Prime Minister at the time when you were holding uh, this placard in 1992. Now the reason I saw this postcard, because I haven't been to the Mining Museum in Wales, was because one of my friends posted it to me and he put a speech bubble on it uh, which had you saying, shall we stand here and smash capitalism? or go home and get Janie to make us some puddings. <laughs> Jane being the name of your wife. Uh, so you can see we were taking you very seriously back in the day. Anyway, I'm going to move on now to the book of Leviticus, uh, which you claim says that God owns all the land and people don't own the land or can't own the land. Uh, because it belongs to God, um, which is actually the opposite of what Leviticus 25 says, that you can't sell your land forever, not because it doesn't belong to you, but because it does belong to you. So you only sell it for a period of time, and then after a certain number of years, your land um, is returned to you. The purpose of this being that people and families were not deprived forever of their land. Maybe they'd just sell it for a little while, some of it, if they fell into hardship or if they didn't need so much land for a period of time. They didn't need so many crops. Um, so that's what they'd do. They'd sell the land for a period of time and then in the Jubilee year it would be returned to them or to the family. So I'm going to make some quotations from Leviticus 25 now, uh, reading from verses 11 to 17. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth or harvest the unpruned vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. In this year of Jubilee you shall return, every one of you, to your property. When you make a sale to your neighbour, or buy from your neighbour, you shall not cheat one another. When you buy from your neighbour, you shall pay only for the number of years since the Jubilee. The seller shall charge you only for the remaining crop years. If the years are more, you shall increase the price, and if the years are fewer, you shall diminish the price, for it is a certain number of harvests that have been sold to you. You shall not cheat one another, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord your God. And this is also Leviticus 25, verses 23 to 28. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are, but aliens and tenants. Throughout the land that you hold, you shall provide for the redemption of the land. If any one of your kin falls into difficulty and sells a piece of property, then the next of kin shall come and redeem what the relative has sold. If the person has no one to redeem it, but then prospers and finds sufficient means to do so, the year since its sale shall be computed, and the difference shall be refunded to the person to whom it was sold and the property shall be returned. But if there are not sufficient means to recover it, what was sold shall, be, shall remain with the purchaser until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released, and the property shall be returned. So who is the property being returned to? Is it being returned to God? Is it being returned to the state, or to the city elders, or anything like that? No, it's been returned to the person who owns it outright. So you can't sell the land permanently 
because you own it outright you can't be deprived permanently of your ancestral land so Leviticus 25 actually says the opposite of what you say that it says that no one can own anything it actually says that you own things so completely you can't sell them permanently so you're relying on the fact that the majority of people haven't read Leviticus the majority of people won't bother to go and check what you've said um, and you probably even believe it's this way yourself because it's what you want to believe it's the political agenda that you're promoting that you always promote which is communism and you seem to think that communism and Christianity are synonymous and they most certainly are not Christianity is not a collectivist ideology so stop going on about Leviticus as if it promotes communism because in fact it promotes the opposite if anything <laughs> and I also want to make a comment about another Bible passage that you use um, to justify environmentalism and this is from the creation narrative um, in Genesis uh, chapter 1 uh, which you don't believe in by the way but um, you do select one particular part of it um, to promote your environmentalist ideology um, which is that God looks at what he has made and he says that it's very good um, he, he repeatedly says that his creation is good in Genesis chapter 1 um, and when he's completed creation he says that it's very good so you use this um, to promote the idea uh, that we should look at creation in this way that it's very good and this is how God looks at it and it's what we ought to do and we ought to take care of the environment which I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of the environment I'm just not going along with your particular environmental ideology which is in fact uh, world communism <laughs> and the new world order um, but the fact is that uh, God did create everything very good and he did say in Genesis chapter 1 it's very good but then you're overlooking the fact accidentally on purpose uh, that in Genesis um, chapter 3 um, Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil um, and this brings sin and death into the world so then God says cursed is the ground because of you so he does say it's very good in Genesis chapter 1 but then in Genesis chapter 3 um, he he says the ground is cursed because of you and then in Genesis chapter 6 um, he regrets um, creating because um, there's so much violence in the world and then he destroys the world with a flood and only Noah and his family and the species that they take on the ark are preserved um, so it's all very well quoting Genesis chapter 1 which you don't even believe anyway to say that God sees the creation good but the created order is now fallen sin and death have come into the world so God is not looking at the world now thinking it's very good uh, because if he didn't think that way uh, then he wouldn't have come in flesh as Jesus to redeem the world um, because it wouldn't be fallen which it is and you're quite happy to regard the world as fallen uh, when you're trying to evade the disastrous consequences of your actions like you did in your lecture at the British Academy in December 2015 uh, when you said basically that you have pure intentions and that the only reason there's any bad outcome is because we live in a sinful fallen world and other people are sinful so the world is sinful and fallen when it gets you off the hook 
uh, but it's very good when you want to promote your environmentalist agenda. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. You also talk in one of these clips I've played uh, where you were talking about um, Leviticus that um, God says in the book of Proverbs um, that he's delighted uh, with creation and you don't say on that instance that which part of the book of Proverbs um, God says that he's very delighted with creation but in another sermon that you gave which is also available on YouTube um, you refer um, to the wonderful image of wisdom playing before creation um, so you're alluding to Proverbs chapter 22 um, the only w which talks about wisdom um, being present uh, before creation. The only problem is um, it doesn't talk about wisdom playing before creation. In fact you talk about wisdom delighting in the whole span of the universe and playing um, but this isn't from the book of Proverbs, it's from um, the Hymn to Wisdom which is by Janet Morley and is published in her book All Desires Known uh, which was published in 1992 and this is what it says she played before creation this is wisdom she played before creation when the world was made and in her hands are all things held together she has danced upon the face of the deep and all that has breath is instinct with her life the mystery of creation is in her grasp and yet she delights to expound her ways. So that's Janet Morley's Hymn to Wisdom which you get mixed up um, with the book of Proverbs um, chapter 8 uh, beginning at verse 22, verses 22 to 31. Um, even Janet Morley doesn't mention the whole span of the universe. You've made that up yourself. And by the way, according to your biography, Janet Morley is a friend of yours. <laughs> so I think you're thinking of her hymn to wisdom when you say this. But you don't even quote that correctly. Uh, but if we look at Proverbs chapter 8, um, verses 22 to 31, which has a similar passage to this hymn to wisdom uh, written by Janet Morley, we can find out what wisdom um, is really delighting in. So I'm going to read from verse 27. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in the inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. So wisdom isn't delighting in the whole span of the universe. She's rejoicing in the inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. So you've twisted that round once again to promote environmentalism. It's the human race that wisdom is delighting in, not the whole span of the universe. So I'm going to leave that there for now, but I'm going to go on to comment about more of what you said at the launch of Eco Church at St Paul's Cathedral on the 26th of January 2016. Uh, when you talk about deforestation in Kenya. Christian belief assumes that because God is creator, what God sees and knows and loves in creation is what matters. And that's where we go right back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1. And what does God say about creation? He says it's good. Indeed, very good. And that, of course, means that if we are to live as people of faith, to live as if God's vision of creation were the one that mattered, 
we live in and out of that affirmation at the beginning of scripture. God sees what there is, and in his eyes it is good. And the Christian response to climate change is a matter of faith. A matter of faith. Seeing ourselves, seeing the world as God sees. And of course that takes us to awareness, doesn't it? What's the awareness we're trying to grow into? Something remotely like God's awareness. God's generous awareness, God's loving awareness, God's delighted awareness. God looks at the world and sees it good, and according to Proverbs, he's really happy about it. God loves the fact that the world is there. And part of what God asks of us is that we love the world because it's there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And the deepest religious basis for our commitment to the environment in which God has placed us is this recognition that we are called to be and are enabled to be the place where God's love for the world comes through. We have to flesh out in our lives that fundamental biblical conviction that when God looks on the world, he finds it good. We have to show in our lives some echo of the delight God finds in creation, recalling the astonishing image in the book of Proverbs of God's eternal wisdom playing and rejoicing in the whole span of the universe. In my ten somewhat uh, eventful years as uh, doing some sort of job in the church, which I remember vaguely, <laughs> um, I had the privilege and the challenge of traveling a great deal and seeing something of what these issues meant in different parts of the world. And so when I think of issues around ecology and the environment, it's particular people and places that come to mind. I think of visits to Western Kenya and the desolate deforested landscape that was around in some areas, the desertification of land. And I think of dogged little groups there working away at reforestation and at various ecologically friendly and sustainable means of surviving, finding fuel and so forth. This is not an optional extra for tree-hugging eccentrics. This is something which is bound up with our sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters worldwide, for the most vulnerable communities in the world, and of course not least for our own descendants. Because as soon as people begin to say, well, actually, you know, we can't really afford ecologically friendly measures, you need to be ready to say, that's exactly the kind of thing we have to afford, because it's not an alternative to justice, not an alternative to the care of the poor, and so on. Right, I'm now reading from an article by Lynette Obari and J.B. Wangwe um, of the World Rainforest Movement entitled Underlying Causes of Deforestation and Forest Degradation in Kenya. So they're talking about the Mao Forest and um, I've abbreviated this article quite a lot because it's pretty long. Um, but I'll put a link in the show notes. The forest is gazetted and is under the managerial custody of the state's forest department. It was first gazetted in 1932 by the colonial government. Mao Forest is the home of the largest group of forest dwellers, the Ogiek, 
Since time immemorial, the Ogiek people have been living inside the Mao forest, depending on the forest for subsistence and shelter. Um, so those are quotations from the article and I'm commenting now to summarise um, what the article says in the following paragraphs that the colonial and post-colonial governments in Kenya have repeatedly tried to evict the Ogiek from between 1904 and 1992 and in 1992 they forcibly evicted all the forest dwellers. So I'm going on to quote again from the article. Forest resources played an important role in Ogiek culture, rendering their conservation vital. The conservation measures that were passed on to the community by the elders include ensuring that there were no forest outbreaks. Community members were prohibited from cutting certain trees. Only experienced elders were allowed to cut back from trees to make beehives. In order to manage the forest properly, the Ogiaks allocated blocks of forest to clans to use. The forest areas are first occupied by a clan, which then divides it according to the family tree. Boundaries are recognised according to the customary land tenure system. I'm moving on to a section about logging now. Sawmillers obtain licences to permit them to practice logging. They also have to pay logging fees to the Forest Department. That's a government department, the Forest Department. The sawmillers do not stick to the guidelines on logging and the Forest Department does not have the mechanisms to enforce the rules and regulations. The forests have been logged in a non-systematic way. I'm moving on to a section now about the protection of rivers and streams. The Ogiek protected streams by making sure that no cultivation is done within 50 metres on both sides of the rivers. However, this can no longer be ensured as the government is always removing them from the forests and resettling them elsewhere. The Ogieks have used their indigenous knowledge to sustainably utilise the forest products, honey, wild fruits and nuts, game meat, and ensure the resources are protected. They noted with concern that the destruction of the forest is done by outsiders who burn charcoal and fell trees for timber. The forest is the ancestral land of the Ogieks. They had customary land rights over the forests. They have been evicted from the forest many times. They are also prohibited from grazing, hunting and collecting honey in the forest. I'm now moving on to a section called politics. As a result of political rivalry, forests were given to supporters of particular politicians or as a bribe or repayment for political patronage. The decision regarding forests lies in the hands of the Minister of Natural Resources, who is influenced by other top politicians. Natural resources are destroyed to enrich the political royalty. So that's a very long article and that's some short quotations from the article. But the point that I'm making is that if the land hadn't been stolen from the Ogieks, then there would be no deforestation in Kenya. So if their land rights had been respected, then there would be no deforestation in Kenya because they lived in the forest, they owned the forest, they were invested in preserving the forest because they understood it and they understood how to protect the habitat that they needed to live in. So, as soon as the government came in and started evicting them and making laws and allowing other people to go and rob the land off these people, then the deforestation started. So it's completely and utterly insane to suggest that taking land away from private ownership is the solution to environmental degradation because in fact the opposite is true. <laughs>
But the reality is that you don't care about the environment. The only thing you care about is promoting your own political ideology because you're an enormous snob, you're a bigot, um, you're an intellectual, you think you're an intellectual, you're a pseudo-intellectual, and you think you know better than other people how they ought to live and what they ought to think, and that people shouldn't be able to manage their own lives and property without having arrogant idiots like you dictating to them their every move. So you don't care an iota about the environment, because otherwise you would inform yourself about it, wouldn't you? And stop spouting political crap. <laughs> that has no basis at all in reality and you know perfectly well that it doesn't. So anyway, that's my comment on deforestation in Kenya which you mentioned in your talk um, at the launch of Eco Church. Um, and that's the end of my video for today although there's plenty of clips in it as you will see. And um, it's your Dietrich Bonhoeffer moment this week, isn't it? So I might come and arrest you. <laughs> so have a nice week. Hasta la próxima. Canada was selling the Soviets uh, wheat because the Soviets and the Bol Bolshevik Revolution, the Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. They had the most wonderful wheat and they fed all of Europe from this Ukrainian breadbasket. Well, the uh, communist leaders, being mostly intellectuals, who had never been on a farm, and they had no idea where food came from, uh, they decided to kill the peasants. In fact, the joke in uh, uh, Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution was, this is the Workers' and Peasants' Party. Uh, they enslaved the workers and killed the peasants. And that's why it's the Peasants' and Workers' Party. So that's the story of communism, 1948. Um, somebody, um, well, you can't, you can't buy land from, like, you can't buy unowned land. Who are you going to give the money to? You would enclose unowned land, I would assume, right? There's huge amounts of historical precedents for how land uh, ownership accrues in a free society. Um, just, you can do research on this if you want. Um, tons of stuff on Mises.org and so on about how people used to homestead land in a free society. I mean, outside of the government handing them land claims and so on. So... That's all been solved uh, by common law many, many years uh, and many, many uh, times in the past. So you can purchase land. Uh, one, if somebody manages to take over a huge amount of land and uh, he chop down all the trees if he wants to, he's not going to want to. Oh, man. Ugh, people are not random billiard balls that just bounce around doing crazy stuff all the time. I mean, come on. That's like saying, well, what if a farmer... Uh, encloses and fences and prepares and fertilizes and clears all the tree off and plants all this wheat and then just sets fire to it. That's not how people work. I mean, what kind of crazy-ass planet are you living on? If somebody encloses the land, gets rid of all the trees, digging up all the roots, it brings in nice soil and, and, and uh, fertilizes and plows and plants and nurtures, they're not going to set fire to their wheat. They're going to grow the wheat and they're going to make sure that the investment that they put into making the land highly arable is going to accrue over the long term by getting more crops planted. Again, I, I don't know how to make it any clearer than that. Somebody who has a whole big forest is not going to just chop down all the trees. They're going to want to replant the trees so that they can harvest them again in the future. I mean, come on! <laughs> Ugh, I don't know. I don't know what people, I, you, just, you just play SimCity uh, on, on drugs? I don't know how people even come up with these questions. Um, forest management is an ancient practice among human beings. Human beings have always wanted trees. And forest management is an ancient practice. The only reason that people at the moment cut down all the trees is because the government retains ownership of the land. If the government 100% transferred ownership of the land with trees on it to private companies, then those private companies would make sure that they replanted the trees. Why? Because if you only harvest the trees once, and then you have all this land, nobody else wants it. So you can't bid that much for it because you're only going to get one set of um, trees out of it. Uh, so you can bid more for the land if you can get a renewable resource, if you can plant trees and grow trees and plant trees and, and grow trees. So given that you can bid the most for a, a resource that you can renew, 
ownership will accrue to those who can bid the most for it, uh, which means creating or maintaining the resource as renewable. Uh, I mean, how much are you going to pay for a printer which says, uh, after you print one page, uh, I'm going to self-destruct, right? Well, you're not going to pay anything for it because you want a printer that can print multiple pages. Anyway, so, God, <laughs> I don't know where you people live. Um,